Chino with the Y. What's up, man? Hey, what's up, Glenn? You doing all right? I'm good, man. Thanks for taking the time. I would imagine you're super busy, you know, having just released your album about a week ago. So I, I really appreciate you taking the time. No, it's my pleasure, man. It's just promo stuff, you know, but uh, this one I, th I thought would be fun. since it's like a little more personal, yeah. a little longer, and it's just a discussion. So I think I'm going to just chill and have a glass of wine and have a conversation. So that's cool. First of all, congratulations on Mamluk, the, the latest album that you've just released. Your, your second solo album, correct? You're the first one who got that right, you know, because I got a bunch of projects. So they kind of like group them all together. But this is definitely my second. I listened to the interview you did with Big Hass. I thought it was interesting that you mentioned Hip Hop Hooray by Naughty by Nature as kind of like your first songs that really kind of where you caught the bug, possibly. You know, I remember vividly going to the States in 1992 and that song had just come out. I mean, there's just an energy to that song that's just undeniable, you know? 100%, man. I want to get a sense of, A, how, you, how it is that you speak English so well, being that you're, you're half Syrian, half Filipino. Where did you get exposed to English? At, at what stage in, in your kind of upbringing did that happen for you? I think, you know, I was born in the Philippines and uh, my mother doesn't speak, doesn't speak Arabic and my father doesn't speak Tagalog, the Filipino language. So at home, I started actually, you know, speaking Tagalog. I think that's the first language I was catching uh, because of my surroundings. But classic Arab, my dad did not like that. You know, <laughs> yeah. so he was kind of like forcing English to be the language spoken. Yeah. So I don't lean towards Tagalog more than Arabic because I was living in the Philippines yeah. back then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so we had a lot of English at home so he can be part of the conversation. Gotcha. And then when we moved to Saudi, that definitely became like, you know, the stronger, like the more important language because I wasn't surround by, surrounded by Filipinos yeah. and I was going to international school. And uh, if you're in Saudi Arabia or in general in the Gulf, as you know, you know, it's so super multicultural. So especially if you're a foreigner, if you're a foreigner in the Gulf, you're pretty much going to stick with foreigners a lot. Yeah. You yeah, know, yeah, yeah. that's kind of like how the vibe goes. So I think that's what happened. And I, when I went to Saudi Arabia, uh, even before my teenage years, I started playing a lot of sports okay. and Americans are known for their love for competition. Oh yeah, definitely. So I started playing baseball and basketball and around with the Americans in Jeddah. Yep. And that's where I started like, you know, my English just, and the Americans are tough, man. They're just, they just start, you know, they kind of bully you till oh, yeah. you get it right. Definitely. You know, with the accent, especially when you're young. That, that, man, it's like, if you deviate just the slightest, it, it's as if you're speaking a language that's from a different universe. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, you know, I have a good friend that says category instead of category. You know what I mean? And like, I remember he came and visited me in the States and it's like, people couldn't understand that he was, he was saying, even if, you know, contextually, it's obvious he's trying to say category, but because he pronounced it the way he does, people yeah. were like, what are you saying? What's he saying? Yeah. <laughs> you know? So I, I can relate to that. Yo, Americans are... Americans are like relentless with that stuff. I remember as a kid, a friend of mine came from Minnesota and he came to Jeddah and we became really good friends. Yeah. But I, I, I said com comfortable one time because yeah. <laughs> that's how we would say it in the Philippines, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know? Yeah. Bro, he wouldn't let me go. He, he just, <laughs> it's just like, he just made fun of it. Yeah. And I remember another kid, you know, who is also American. And then I said, you know, he showed me like a video game or something. And I said, wow, nice. And he's like, nice. That's all you can say about it. You know, like, say, I was like, what should I say? And he's like, cool, you know, awesome yeah, or something. Yeah, I was yeah, like, yeah. oh my God, you guys are relentless. Yeah. <laughs> I had something similar where, you know, I had just gone to the States and one of my first friends at the time, you know, was teaching me about football. And I don't know, there was a, there was a commercial for a Tom Cruise movie, I think. And I remember saying he's pretty, not knowing that there's like handsome and, you know, beautiful or whatever. He's like, pretty? Like, what's wrong with you? You know, I, I was just trying to say he's handsome. You know what I mean? It's like, <laughs> so I, like, I'll, yeah. I never lived that one down. Like to this day, you know, he's like, do you remember? I was like, yeah, unfortunately I do, you know, but <laughs> you know what I mean? Like you, you get your act together real quick when people start bullying you, especially, you know, during your teenage years and stuff. It's, and it's, it's brutal. It's really brutal. Yeah, no, it's super brutal, man. Uh, and and I think that's like what got me like, you know, into the culture of like, you know, battle rap and stuff. It's like, you know, growing up, 
you get like, especially an American culture around you, you get kind of like, so I wasn't really in an American school. I was like hanging around Americans, but because my dad is still so Arab, yep. he wanted me to be in a, a, in a more local school yep. to understand Arabic. So I was hanging around a lot of Americans, but I would go to school with a bunch of Arabs as well, yeah, yeah, you know? Yeah. So there was this like, you know, weird dynamics that I, uh, I grew up around and me have, trying to fit in with the American people and then going back and hanging out with the Arabs and then also trying to fit in yeah, so, somehow. Yeah, yeah. It was really tough because I, I got bullied in both sides, really. But not like, you know, and that that's where I earned like my stripes, I feel, you know, and and being able to ha or having a chip on my shoulder yeah, in general, yeah, yeah. you know, and really disregarding what people say and be able to brush things and also maybe go at people when uh, who are being disrespectful or aggressive. I have, gotcha. you know, no qualms about that. Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. So it, it, is the common spoken language between your parents English then since your dad doesn't speak uh, or, or your mom doesn't speak Arabic, right? Yeah. So they communicate in my English? My mom doesn't speak Arabic and my dad does live in Philippines right now. Okay. Again, also classic Arab. He's been there since the beginning of the war in Syria. Wow. I mean, you know, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. and he still don't speak any Tagalog, bro. Wow. Like, he's, is, is he he's just adamant to not he, ever speak Tagalog in the Philippines. What's his, what's his hang up? I mean, wh wh why doesn't he want to blend in or like try to, you know? As Arabs in general, I feel like sometimes we have like a superiority complex yeah, about definitely. this stuff, I yeah, think, yeah, man. Yeah, you know, and I feel like, okay, we're, we're, we're here, uh, people who work. And our countries are like, you know, Filipinos. So they kind of have to learn how to understand what I'm saying regardless yeah. kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. it's like Americans going to like foreign countries and True. just shouting things in oh, English really loud. Absolutely. Like, like they're supposed to understand you. I feel like it's the same thing. Ask a French person's biggest pet peeve about Americans. And that would be, you know, it. I mean, I grew up in France and I get the whole French pride thing. And, and I get the American... You know, I mean, the French, all you have to do, it's like, you just have to try to speak French and they'll immediately switch to English, you know, just to help you out. But if you come in, you know, like speak in English, like you own the place, they're they're going to give it to you, you know, so I can, I understand where that comes from for sure. That's the thing about me is like, I'll try to like, you know, have a couple of words for every, any country I've went to. Yeah. And I remember when I went to Paris, everybody's like, yo, they are the most unhelpful people and they're really rude to like tourists. Yeah. But when I went there, man, I'm really dumb, especially before, like, before GPS, yep. you know, before maps, yep. Google Maps yeah, yeah, yeah. and whatnot. I used to go there and I would just ask people and they were really cool, to be honest, man. <laughs> At least to me, I would, I would try. Yeah, I would that's try. what I'm saying. I think it's, you know, my every, French is terrible, even though I live. Everybody, everybody has a different perspective. But I, I think, I mean, you touched on it. It, it. It's the fact that you you made the effort. You know what I mean? And I feel like. I mean, yes, there are rude people there, just like there are rude people everywhere. But if you try, I found that they'll yeah. they'll go out of their not not out of their way, but they'll 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 be you know cordial and and, and try to help you out. You know what I mean? Yeah, no, it, it's it, I've been to France a few times. Um, luckily, growing up, I had a few tours over there, yeah. and uh, I, I, I there's something about being in France that I really like but to a limited extent. Yeah. I don't know why. Yeah. Like I go to Paris, you know, it's always been limited. Yeah. But moving around in France, I remember it was just like after a week, I'm like, I know I can't stay here any longer. Yeah. I feel like yeah, yeah, yeah. there's something that's telling me I need to go, yeah. you know, yeah. like, you don't need to discover anything more. This is it. Now leave. You know? I, I, <laughs> I always feel that. I, I, I don't know why. I feel you. So, so let's kind of fill in the gaps a little bit or just to get caught up in terms of like, okay, so you were born in the Philippines, went to straight from there to Saudi yes, Arabia? Uh, to Jeddah. How long were you in Saudi Arabia for? For like nine years. Nine years. Okay. To Syria from there or what part of the Middle East? Syria right after that. Gotcha. You know, my dad finished working over there. He had this like long stint because he was there before we moved, you know? Gotcha. Um, they, they, my parents met in the Philippines yep. and then he was already working in Saudi Arabia then going back and forth for me because I was born and then we moved to Saudi Arabia when he got settled in yep. uh, and then when things you know didn't finish you know didn't work out at the very end he moved to, back to Syria this is around like 99 or something 2000 gotcha. you know 2000 let's say yep. yeah I mean for me it was such a culture shock to move to Damascus yeah, man, it was so different. Like, I remember going because I got put into a public school. Uh, so the first day of school in Damascus, yeah. I had to wear like 
the army do it. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, like yeah. The, I remember that. Yeah, like it's not fatigues, but the green stuff, you know, and with the with the whole strap, you know, with the, <laughs> with the shoulder pads <laughs> oh, yeah. and everything, and the hat, and then and then also coming from Saudi, uh, you didn't have cold. So I remember going to school in the morning, and it was cold as it was cold as fuck, you know. So I'm chilling. There's and then I remember walking into the class into the like you know the first room that you know for the person who the hall attendant or or whatever i went into the room and then there was a sobia so that's like classical heaters oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. and i remember just thinking the first thing that popped my hat man in my mind i was like oh my god i'm in soviet russia what <laughs> yeah, the fuck is going exactly, on yeah. here man you know uh, <laughs> i was like what the hell did i get myself into yeah, yeah. that was the first as if I had like a lot of choices, you know, yeah. as if it was up to me. But I remember like walking in there. I'm like, what did I do to myself? Yeah. Why am I here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so how long did you have to endure that for? How many years before you, you made your next uh, exit? Uh, so I was in, in Damascus for like four years, okay. uh, five years. Yeah, four years, four years. I finished high school. Okay. I pretty much did my whole high school in, in Syria. And then I went to college in Beirut. So this is and this, that was without my family. I just moved myself. Gotcha. And this is all in Arabic. It, while you were in Syria, you were in the in the Arabic system, correct? Yeah, yeah. Uh, for the first like two years, and I was telling my dad, it's like this is not going to cut it for me. You know, like my grades weren't good. I was really ba barely scraping along. Yep. So I told him I want to take the GCSEs. Yep. You know, like the. Yeah, British curriculum, True. you know, international yep. general certificate for secondary education. But that's like the British from Cambridge. So I was like, I want to do that because I don't want to do any more. It was so difficult for me, man, like, you know, switching up and switching that culture, really, you know, and way of learning. It was too difficult. Right. And so I finished my GCSEs and then I went to Beirut. Did you go to AUB while you were there in, in Beirut? LAU, LAU. I was studying banking. Uh, so I was, I, I always heard like, I always heard like, go, if you want to study business, go to LAU, yep. but that's not true. <laughs> if you want to study anything in Lebanon, you go to AUB. <laughs> like, that's, I, I just that's assumed really you'd go there. I, I, I would have, yeah, I would have <laughs> thought that. And is that because it's something you wanted to get into or it was kind of a, something that just made sense to you at the time? Honestly, I was good at economics, oh, Okay, you know? So I like, when I was in high school and you did GCSE, you still did like some business courses, you know, yep. so you would do economics, business and accounting. So I really was really good at economics yep. and I wanted to do economics. Gotcha. But my dad talked me out of it because, again, man, like classical Arab, he felt like, you know, economics was too like, you know, educational, yep. you know, that it, you couldn't implicate it in business. Gotcha. And my dad is like that classical Damascene yep. businessman, yep. like yep. my whole family speaks in the same manner yeah, yeah. which is like business on all the time every day yeah, yeah. you know you walk into a, a you walk into a room you know kind of like already getting into conversation to ask people who got money to invest yeah, you know yeah, like yeah. that's that's a classic the damascene businessman yeah, yeah. gotcha do, do you have a lot of uncles and aunts from your dad's side huge amount they're a huge family they're nine all together gotcha. as kids oh, okay you know two aunt, two sisters and seven brothers wow. so i'm in Damascus, I was surrounded by cousins and uncles and aunts. Yeah. You must have gone through so many, I mean, just the range of emotions. Like, you know, to come from Philippines to Saudi Arabia, then to Lebanon. I mean, I can only imagine what you must have gone through. That's insane. When it comes to like coming to Syria, I think I, I was kind of hopeful for it because I used to come to Syria in summer. Yep. And when I would come to Damascus in the summer, I would see a lot of other foreigner kids or like, you know, kids who lived outside yep. and come for summer. Yep. I remember I met like some friends of Syrian people living in Dubai, captain of a hockey team in Dubai. And then I used to play hockey with them and rollerblades. Like, you know, oh, like, nice. so when I was young, going to Damascus in summer, it felt like the coolest place in the world. Yeah. But then winter comes and you're like, oh, yeah, get me out this of here. This is different. Oh, <laughs> yeah, for school sure. is different. For sure. When you get into the, you know, nitty gritty of being in Damascus. Yeah. And I kind of like was there also before the changes that happened, yeah. you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. in terms of like policies uh, and social, sure, yeah. in a social manner, you know, yeah, yeah. like there's a lot of like policies, like internet was still like, you know, n not a real thing. A Cell phones weren't a real <laughs> yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah, for sure. No, it was just a different world. Since you left Syria and you, I mean, you've been based in Lebanon since 2004. Have you had a chance to go back 
much since then? Actually, like as soon as I graduated, the first because I graduated as a banker. So the first thing I did was like go back to Damascus. Yeah. I'm done with my stint in Beirut. Yeah. This is college. Go back, see my family and try to get this job at the bank. Uh, got one at accounting really quick, a tele- telecommunication yeah. firm, then worked at a bank at Treasury for a while. Okay. And uh, it was not good, man. Yeah. I was the most depressed human being around. I couldn't be around my family. I was just really going nuts, like literally like spending my days doing, you know, like banking work and then spending my nights partying and getting messed up yeah. because I was just not in a good mind frame. Gotcha. Obviously, I already did hip hop since I was young, yep. you know. My first concert was in Damascus in 2001. So I already had that bug, like, I want to do this. Yep. So my first opportunity to leave banking was like, uh, a f- you know, I took it, went to Beirut, said, I'll take a two month course to do some, you know, like extra courses in university, try to get like a minor or something yeah. and something else. Yeah, yeah. And then instead I joined, joined a theater group with Nidal Asher, a big, uh, the owner of uh, Medina Theater. Yeah. And she's also a big director here from since the yeah. 80s and 90s, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, actress and director. So I started touring with her as an actor slash rapper in her play. Very cool. And then I joined Ferit. Okay. And then I was like, okay, I don't know if I want to do banking anymore. Yeah. I think I'm just going to start rapping here. And the scene must have just been like barely popping off at the time, right? I mean, we're talking mid or early to mid 2000s across the Middle East. That was still kind of a, a non-starter. I don't think there were that many uh, MCs or, or rappers at the time, right? Yeah. So 2008, I can kind of came back into 2008. It took like a couple months to do some courses. And then Ferit, we were like jumps on the end of 2008. And there are some acts, but we like... It was just like a really fun thing that us kids were doing. Yeah. You know, yeah. it was no business in it. There's no, there was still media wasn't latching to the concept. True. It was just us really running the streets. I mean, as Ferit, we would literally be with speakers or monitors or whatever, yeah. tables, a battery, microphone, and a beat, beatboxer. Yeah. My man, John Nusser, as a bassist, FZ, a beatboxer, and me and Ed just rapping, yeah. Yeah. you know, on a beatbox and a bass on the streets. Yeah. You know, so we just definitely just did it for fun. And we had a lot of sh- like we were getting shows because of the uniqueness of what we did. Sure. We were rappers with with a mini band. Gotcha. And then we got signed to Forward Records. And then they were telling us, like, OK, you need to expand your sound. How big was your audience? Like, did you have a, a, a not a cult following, but were you able to kind of develop a, a dedicated audience that was kind of following what you guys were doing and kind of going to to watch you perform, you know, as you were? touring locally at all honestly i can't, I don't know how to quantify that anymore you know yeah. like when i when i remember it in, a, in memory i'm like yeah we did have a fan base yeah. uh we had a lot of people talking about us buzz and newspapers yeah, yeah, yeah. uh we were coming up at the same time as mishlur and Leda, yeah. you know yeah, so course, yeah, yeah. we had similar buzz but how would you quantify that now when you don't have followership when there was no record yeah, of your plays? Yeah, it, you don't it, it, i don't even know yeah. how many cds were sold you know what i'm saying no, I, I feel you i'm just wondering that like for instance if you're at a venue that that you know where the capacity is 150 were you guys would you play to us a, a sold so we out? started off venues that are like oh barely fitting 100 yep. we'd fill that up gotcha okay and we started going to venues that are like we're filling 200 and we would fill that up you know as we got along we got into bigger venues yep. Uh, but I don't know if that's specifically us because we were like getting booked in a lot of festivals True. and we were rocking those festivals like mad yeah. because, uh, just our sound was so different and our energy was like so different yeah. because it's a live band with that type of music that everybody's kind of used to listening. You know, at that point, yeah. it wasn't like, you know, samples and drum breaks and drum machines and, you know, compressed sound. Gotcha. They were used to hearing live music yep. and people performing in front of them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So th- musically, sonically, it made sense to them. But there's this like rap energy, which is quite aggressive. Yeah. That they were like, okay, this is kind of cool. I like this, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I, I didn't get a chance to listen to what you, what you sounded like when you were with uh, Fadil Atrash. H- how much of that experience kind of seeps into the Mamluk project or, or your previous works? I think um, the energy that seeps out is the community vibe that I have, yep. you know, just in general in my work ethic. Gotcha, um, gotcha. That I learned a lot from being with Farid yeah. and to how to manage, you know, personalities um, 
uh, co- conflict of interest yeah. and all those things. I definitely learned young with the, with the Farid. Yeah, 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 gotcha. Uh, compromising and not compromising in terms of art, when to do that and when to put your foot down. And when I started doing my first solo project, I remember just going completely off and saying, I'm taking control of everything because when I was with the band, I had to compromise a lot in terms of like concept because it's just hard. It's not like there was, you know, you're, problems. You're it one was of just many. I mean, hard yeah, to exactly. solidify this. Aspect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like especially abstract thoughts that like they're not even solidified until the song is completely done. Right. right? right, right, right. Uh, so you kind of have to solidify an idea with your with your group before you you kind of pitch it to them. Right, right, right. You have to have it like framed already. Gotcha. But when I'm working alone, kind of can build into this world step by step. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. Uh, I can start with a feeling instead of like a full concept and try to get that objective. Right, right, you know, right, gotcha. and that leads to, for me at least, it leads to more an artistic output. Gotcha. It just in general, it just feels more like art than creating a song. Yeah. So, so I understand you were producing out of necessity when you first started. Did that start with Fadi or did that happen after? I was already like producing when I was with Fadi, yep. but it wasn't like, I was already producing a lot of songs before Fadi. But when I was with Fadi, uh, we w- I was just more directing gotcha. and I wasn't really finalizing any of the projects. Yeah. I wasn't on the boards itself. And I kind of missed that uh, and kind of missed like just also directing the sound I wanted to go to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so with with Make Music Feel at Home, I was like, let me bang this these beats out on my own, yeah, yeah. get people I can collaborate with as well and choose the people I can also work with, but at the same time also implement what exactly I want to do, right, you know? Right, right. Were you also doing... Uh kind of a, not fusion, but you were doing both Arabic and English with Farid as well? A lot less. A lot less of the fusion stuff with Farid. I would have like maybe like a song or two in English. And like, I remember in the first album, there was only one song in English. Yeah. The second song I chose, the second album, I chose not to do any English in that album. Yeah. Um, I think I think it was just, I, I really wanted to fit in in the scene, man. You know, like that's what's happening. Yeah. Uh, there was not a lot of Arabic rap, so we even John he really wanted to nurture the Arabic rap, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know. That makes sense. So yeah. we focused on being Arabic with with Farid. Yeah, gotcha. And and when I was writing making me when I was writing making music and feel at home, I I was already, I was living in Barcelona. So, I heard you mention that. What took you to Barcelona? Um. So when 2011 hit yep. and in the war in syria was happening yep. my whole family started moving into to the philippines so okay. they were leaving damascus yeah, yeah, yeah. so this anchor that i kind of had with in beirut yep. i felt wasn't there anymore like i started thinking to myself what am i what am i doing here yeah. um i don't have family here yes i have friends but who's gonna like really like wash out for me yeah. And I, I was with somebody at that point and she had a job in, in spain and she was like okay, you want to come through i was like Actually, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know what? Yeah. I really want to come through. Let's do this. Yeah. You know, yeah. uh, I have nothing here. I felt like I, because of what's going on in Syria, I felt like the anchor just like shifted. You know, that rope just kind of like yeah. broke off. And I was just in a drift, you know. And then when I moved to Spain, I just felt even more alienated. Yeah. You know, I felt like I wasn't fitting there as well. Were you active uh, fr- from a production standpoint? Were you, were you putting stuff out while you were in Spain? Were you able to to, to work on any yes, music? Yes, I was there? working on a lot of music, but I couldn't really center myself properly in terms of the scene over there. Gotcha. Firstly, hip hop wasn't like the strongest genre that was hitting in Spain at that point. Yep. And uh, or Barcelona specifically. Yep. Uh, I don't think Barcelona is a big, super big hip hop sure, town, sure. to be honest. Yep. I was there making a lot of music and because of this certain guilt that I felt as well, you know, I, I was really stuck with this guilt of leaving yeah. the Middle East yeah, yeah, yeah. and having this kind of cool, chilled out lifestyle in Europe yeah. uh, that I didn't expect to really have. It just kind of, I just rolled with the punches and I got myself to Barcelona and now I'm looking around, I'm like, this is a pretty good life. Yeah. And my peeps though, aren't doing so well. 
But I, and I, I didn't know if that was the guilt that was eating me up to not assimilate in Barcelona. Yep. Uh, but but it definitely leaked out into the you know into my lyrics. So making music to fill a home was basically that from being entrenched with guilt gotcha. and trying to find what what home is at that point. Yeah. And uh, and that's what it is with my albums. It's really me looking back, reflecting, and the f reflecting on the past few years and do a like, little psychiatric evaluation sure. of what I've been through yeah. and trying to encapsul encapsulate that into a concept and call that an album. Yeah. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not the type of rapper who just kind of la lays out a bunch of bangers and say, hey, you know, this is an album yep. and let's try to find a cool name that links this album together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I kind of am already in a mind state that I, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of already in a mind state. And uh, because of that, I, the direction just kind of, it just falls into place. You know? Gotcha, gotcha. That's really obvious in, in Memluk. I, I definitely hear everything you've just mentioned. I, you know, it's, it's really apparent throughout the, the entire project. You know, albums are, are far and few between now. Everyone is kind of more focused on, you know, it's definitely more singles heavy than, than it is album. What kind of drew you to the yeah. idea of, you know, I, I want to make this kind of a, you know, an album and put it out as opposed to putting it out single by single? Honestly, the, the, the term I'm Luke was just coming through out my lyrics without me even like really like consciously deciding. Yep. Um, my, the first appearance of that is in my song, Al Pacino, which is really this bravado of not being accepted in the scene. Yep. And, you know, because I seem a little Western because of how I speak, yep. I'm privileged and somehow also the gatekeeper of hip hop, yeah, yeah. but also, you know, like it's, it's just a weird, like a perception of what I can, my capabilities and I get disrespected as well. So I was like, going at just people with some bravado yep. and i i mentioned the word mom luke there yeah and i'm like okay like i don't know why and and then my next single after that mbappe the chorus is like they don't like you because you don't look like him yeah so th all the songs that were coming out the subconsciously was like that and i and those two songs didn't make the album but but all the writings that were coming after that had the same theme you know so i was just kind of listening to myself, you know, uh, listening to my subconscious whenever I put my pen on the pad and that was what's coming out. So I felt like I had no choice and I was coming out with bangers, you know, like Russian Roulette was the first song. Yeah. I literally wrote, I think, Russian Roulette almost, I think, before Al Pacino and before Mbappe. I shot that in October 2019. Yeah. I started my album October, uh, August, September 2019. So... Even back then, I was already set to do bangers. I was like, I want to just do bangers. I want to knock out singles, yeah. you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But with the, with the concept just so clearly being part of the process, yeah. I'm like, might as well just come put it together. And I'm old school like that. I love a good, solid album. If you were just as talented as you are today, but you were like, let's say, 100% Lebanese or 100% Syrian or whatever, insert nationality. Do you think people, uh, I'm just trying to understand how much the, the, you know, kind of that mix or the blend, if that gave you any more notoriety or took any away from how you're perceived? I think it's a double-edged sword type of thing. Yeah. I think uh, because of my mixed background, yeah. I feel artistically I have a different perception that makes, that makes it interesting to, especially the media and journalists yep. you know uh and and it's, and also gives a lot of uniqueness to my sound that gives a lot of interest yeah but if we reflect on just art in general people like to see themselves in that art of course uh that's why eminem is so successful yep. in america yep. because white america embraced him because he looked like they look like he looked like them yep. So that made him the success that he was yeah. over a lot of rappers. Not saying he's not talented. He's one of the best lyricists out there. I think he, he knows that. And I think we all know that. Yeah. And so I feel like if it was the same amount of skills and maybe the same amount of output, I would, I would definitely have a bigger fan, fan base, especially if I was Filipino, yeah. because if I was in the Philippines, they rock with their, their peeps and there's a lot oh, yeah, of them. For sure. so that, for, for the sure. numbers would definitely be much bigger, For sure, you know, yeah, yeah. but, but, but also, I don't think I will have such a perspective. Yeah. And I don't know if I would be 
as, as pleased with my output and my art yeah. at the same time. You know, like I feel like I, I don't compromise on on being layered with the things I want to say, yeah. you know, and 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 trying to create that. It's because of who I am, and I don't think I would I would be able to do that, you know, if I if I and have that pers perspective, if I wasn't from multiple backgrounds. At what point did you just own it and said, "This is me. I'm just gonna lead with that." kind of thing. When I was with Fadi, so we were two MCs yeah, in Fadi. Yeah. It was me and Ed Abbas. Yeah. Ed Abbas is half Ivorian, okay, and half Lebanese. Yeah. So he was, you know, he's black. Yeah. So he's in Lebanon, speaks fluent Lebanese, yeah. you know, yeah, yeah. articulates the Lebanese problems in his rhymes better than the Lebanese. All right. And I feel like he doesn't get as much, you know, love for what he does because of that, you know, and he is from the south of Lebanon. You know, his dad just works in Cote d'Ivoire. But he's raised from the south of Lebanon, and his perspective is very Lebanese. But he don't he won't get that that much love in general. I feel because of that. And I remember in Fari, I would address those, you know, like comically. I would address my identity, you know, tongue in cheek in terms of rap, not really like being focused on trying to say that y'all are racist or anything like that. Mm -hmm. Just you know, having fun with it. And I noticed that he never did it. He never, he never really, you know, mentioned that he was biracial, uh, that he had any problems. Yeah. So at some point I, I thought to myself, maybe I, I'm, maybe I should just say I'm Arab yeah. <laughs> and that's it, you know, yeah. like, and roll, roll with that and try to try, try to roll with that kind of punches. Yeah, yeah. And, and the thing is, He was raised in Lebanon all his life, though. Yeah. So he had his accent was impeccable. Yeah. My accent is still like a mixed breed of being in Saudi Arabia sure. around Egyptians, yeah. around Saudis, yeah. Yeah. being roommates with Palestinians, being in Syria, being yeah. with Lebanon. Yeah. Like is like a bastardized Arabic yeah. that I, I speak. Yeah. So I, I I remember at one point I'm like, I speak a bastardized Arabic because my whole identity is a little bastardized sure. because of globalized this globalized era that we live yeah, in yeah. and i started meeting a lot of young kids over here that are from foster families that you know that their parents either passed away or left them and things like that yeah. and they're half lebanese and and they speak fluent arabic but also not accepted so i started like looking around I'm like okay the world around us is getting browner it's getting less it's morphing you know yeah, it's yeah. getting more mixed for sure this is the future and if i, I I just need to be true to myself and say, this is who I am and this is what I need to speak. Yep, yep. And, you know, whatever happened, happened. I love that you did that. I mean, it'd be easy to say, why didn't you do more in Arabic? Why did you do half and half? I, I love how you answered uh, Big Hass's question, which is you just wanted to fully express yourself without like, so if you felt Arabic, you went there. If you felt English, you stayed there. And to me, It ends there. I don't need to elaborate on that because I feel like, you know, self-expression, obviously you're not trying to be something you're not. You're clearly a combination of all the, yeah. you know, it's accumulation of the, the, the places you've visited, you've been, you know, all the cultures you've been exposed to. So hats off to you for kind of sticking to your guns. because you probably, I'm sure a lot of people would have been like, yo, if you're trying to get more Arabs, you need to kind of speak their language. I think given what Mamouk yeah. is, I think you did you in ways that, that, I don't know. I'm, I'm just a fan of how you approached it instead of having to, you know, because you can't please everyone. The, the second you try to please everyone, you almost please no one. You know what I mean? As long as you're happy with it. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, that gives me a lot of like confidence right now. That's really cool. But also like when I was also looking, looking at Nghami, yep. Nghami is like a platform. Of course. All right. Yep. That's basically just for the Middle East. Sure. I don't, you're not going to catch a bunch of foreigners using in yeah, of course. That's just not what happens, yeah. right? And I'm like, let me see who's the biggest, you know, American rap artist on Nghami. Yeah. Obviously, it's Drake. He has like 3.2, 3.3 million followers. Yeah. Then I'm, I'm like, let me look at who's the region in the whole region, biggest output or has the biggest followership. Yeah. I don't want to mention names, but I checked them out. 
and it was like 300,000. So that's like literally a 10% fraction. For sure. So I, I started saying there's a discrepancy on our cultural exchange of course, here. Of course. We are down to listen to an American rapper tell us all about their culture in Arab in Arabic yep. and in, in, in English. English yep. But somehow me trying to export our culture for the West to think like, yo, what's up with these people over there? They're also cool. Yeah. We want to listen to them in what their world. Yeah. That's not okay. They wouldn't listen to me if I speak English, but they'll listen to a foreigner when it comes to English. It's very hypocritical. Yeah, yeah a little bit. You know, I, I see where they're coming from at some point, but I'm like, yo, let me breathe, man. Let me live. Yeah. You know, yeah, let yeah. me live. Let me do me. Hopefully I don't want to be boxed in as well because of, and, and I'm already boxed in anyway. So let me just like do me trying to stack, stack these boxes on top of each other. If I'm boxed in, let me stack these boxes on top of each other yeah. and try to succeed that way. You know, kudos for sticking to your guns on that, because, you know, I think we definitely have an inferiority complex. <laughs> you know what I mean? I don't know why that is. You know, it's always like, oh, he's the Arabic Drake. He's the Arabic this. He's the Arabic that. I'm so over that. I'm so yeah. ready for us to just be like, he just is. He's that good for what he does. It doesn't matter. He just happens to have this background or whatever it is. If if the goods are there, it doesn't matter. We're we're not quite there where we're we're not as accepting as someone who's really hustling and putting in the time. Because clearly, you've been at this for for a hot minute now. I like that yeah. in the local you know hip hop community, you've paid your dues and people are are kind of recognizing that. But I feel like we're still a bit off. We're a bit off where we need to be just to think in ways that aren't as as restrictive as, as we are currently, you know? No, I agree with that. You know, the scene is getting a lot bigger. I've been putting in my work and I understand how the scene works too. Like, uh, I don't want to also, you know, it, my career is spans, let's say like 10, 11 years. Yeah. Um, I've seen platforms go up, CDs go out, yeah. you know, yeah. like there's it, to, the understanding of a platform being forever <laughs> is such a young yeah, for sure. state of mind, for sure. you know, for sure. when, when a young person invests all his like followership to go on SoundCloud yep. and then five years later, they're like, okay, Spotify is this. That's where thing. it's at. Yeah. You're just like, I need to be in the ground. I need to be on the ground making moves, you know, yep. not just relying on these platforms that creates these numbers, sure. you know, because Culture is eternal, man. It's not about uh, and 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 when when we look, talk in terms of longevity, yep. uh, the numbers aren't gonna really uh, do you too much. Like I was saying to Big Hass, I was like, Elmatic, you know, it took a minute for it to get the numbers, yep. you know, it deserves. But we love that album. We respect yep. Nas so much because of his artistic choices, oh, yeah. and he's been here since 94 yeah, yeah, yeah. you know so I, I saw an early you know one of the i think it's probably the original interview that big has did with you maybe like 10 years ago or whatever and you're like if i can leave <laughs> you know a piece of advice you're like you know it's just it's about the work just do the work and i love that you mentioned that talent isn't everything and i i couldn't agree with you more like obviously talent's important but you whatever you lack in talent you can compensate for and willpower and grind and and hard work you know so that, that really resonated with me when I, when I saw that. No, that's 100%, man. And so it's something like I live by sort of biblically, yep. you know, because I feel like I have some talent, but it's the sheer will that kind of, that, that idea of talking things into reality, yep. you know, I think maybe it's that Basirian bis, Damascene business sure. mind that I grew up around yep. where my dad would come into like his brothers or his friends and just have like a mashroor or like a project yeah, yeah, yeah. that he said he wants to do. So he just keeps talking about it and talking about it and talking about it till it happens. Uh, I feel I'm the same way. So if I want to do like this project or this festival or this platform or write a play or write a like series, I'm like always talking about it till I meet the right people and say, oh, you're exactly what I'm looking you're, for, man. You're and find then a way. talk about that when I see him. Absolutely, yeah. You, yeah. It's, it's just always finding the right spots and connecting the dots. And, and I think that's something I took from my, like, my Dem Demacene, yep, yep. you know, Syrian business side. You know, there's something to the Levant. I feel like there's a common thread. It's funny, when I went to the States, I remember there was a lyric in a Tupac song where it's trying to make a dollar out of 15 cent. 
And I was like, man, that's so Syria, you, you know, yeah. but it's also so Lebanon. It's it's very much a Levant thing. You know what I mean? Like they'll MacGyver the fuck out of anything and make it work. You know, it somehow serves them. It, it does what it what they need it to do, you know, uh, but but. I mean, again, that's where you're you're leaning into your roots and making it work, and you know, to your advantage as opposed to like you know being crippled or like, oh, if only I had this, this or that. You're like, this is what I got. I want to make soup. <laughs> you know what I mean? Which I think is great. Hundred percent, man. You you got you know, life gives you lemons, make lemonade, man. And uh, I've been making lots of lemonade since I started. I get just talking that stuff into reality. I felt feel like it's important. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And it, when you get you become like a little one track minded about it. Sure. Uh, you might make us some enemies on the way because you're, you might be quite boring yep. personally yeah, yeah. In, in social circumstances because you're one track minded. Yep. But uh, also people respect uh, goal oriented people. What are some of the things that you feel shackles the advancement of what you or people kind of in your area are trying to do right now? What would you say are the two biggest things that if, if we can get past, it would kind of just blow the doors wide. wide definitely open. The, the regional politics. Yeah, uh, that's definitely an hindrance because it's it's so divisive on how we perceive ourselves, yeah. how we perceive ourselves as a region. Yeah. That uh, you know, like Arabic hip hop, or just in hip hop in general, sure. is very, it's like a protest culture. Yeah is protesting their existence in America. Mm -hmm. And then I, we really adapted it in the Middle East because we have a lot to say. And it was mainly, when you talked about like Arabic hip hop, it was mainly about protesting their environment and what they've been doing, you know, yep. like that's what it was doing. So especially in the Arab Spring, yep. Arab Spring, yep. all the big artists like that we know right now, like Ross, uh, Ferai from 4 to 7 Soul, yep. A lot of those guys, they came up because of what they had to say yeah. during the the Arab Spring. Yeah. And when things started, like, you know, setting into place, you know, like what happened in Egypt, it set into place. Now freedom of speech is also in trouble. Uh, Jordan, you know, I don't know how, you know, like there is limitations to what we have to say. Yeah. And that creates, you know culturally different views on how music should be. Yeah. So when I started doing the arena, there was there was a switch there. There was a big switch that happened where we like, we can enjoy rap without it being hyper-political. Yeah. It could just be about the bars. It could be about lyrics. Yeah. Uh, so that got people activated because now they're like, oh, I don't need to talk about that stuff. So I could just rap about rapping and rap about an opponent about being cool. I could just do that. That's cool. Yeah. And uh, the, so rap since then kind of evolved into something different yeah. than just protest rap music. Sure. But at the same time, now we have this aversion to anything political or socially conscious, especially if it's a little too much, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, and I feel like that's also disrupting the essence of what rap is a little bit. Is there a common thread outside of the political or the injustice part of rap? Yeah, man. Uh, and like in Jordan, obviously there's a limitation to what you want to say politically yep. over yep, there. Yeah, yeah. So like hip hop evolved into a very, very personal thing. Like Synaptic always talks about anxiety, yep. you know, in his first album, Amin Mojad, there's a lot of, dealing with personal anxiety yeah. and depression yeah. and trying to get out of that. And that really resonated to a lot of sure, youth, sure, which sure. is very important, yeah. you know? Yeah. Uh, and also being able to be uh, open and honest about, about and being personal as well. Yeah. That, that uh, introverted outlook upon me. It's, not, it's nothing we have also in the Arab world. Gotcha. Where gotcha. we speak about feelings, yeah. you know? Yeah, yeah, so yeah. that like, semi kind of like emo rap that really resonates with the young kids that was important to have yeah. uh and it's, but but you can't go, go too political and in the gulf there's also that that limit so sure. there's a lot of a lot more and there's also a lot more money so there's a lot more resources that goes into these rappers sure. and there's a lot because of that there's a lot more viewership yep. in the gulf yep. so that shaped how hip hop over there very differently. Yeah, and course. now with Egypt finding its, you know, finding its feet economically, uh, 
a lot of the rappers in Egypt are doing ad work. That also facilitates a different mindset of how to look at hip hop yeah. because now like hip hop is a money making thing. Yeah. And coming from a place that there is poverty, that is something you want to put out there yeah. that we are here making money, trying to get out of the rut. Gotcha. Uh, but because because of that, there's all, all these different perspectives and there's no freedom of be expression. We will not have the unity of conversation because people like us in Lebanon, we got like, or also in Palestine, not because they have the freedom, but because they have nothing else but, you know, their words. Yeah. We get to like, no holds bar, say what we want. Yeah. And, and they're like, well, we're not really hearing that. So there's starting to be a divide, especially I think when it comes to Lebanon and Palestine in terms of that sound. Yeah, yeah, yeah. At this point in your career, how do you measure success? Like, how do you know whether a project, whether it be a single or an album, the second you're done with it, you, you say to me, I've succeeded at capturing what it is that I wanted to capture. But once it's out there in the open for people to consume, how do you measure success at that point? I had a different outlook about this stuff, you know, like, you know, like, oh, let's like push on to the views. Uh, let me do more shows that will make me more successful. Every time I'm into a different mode, like if I'm on tour mode, I'm like, if the more shows I do, the more successful I feel. Yep. Uh, if I'm in like, you know, production mode, the more views I get, I'm in that mode. Yep. But now that I'm in like in my mid thirties, I'm like, I really look, just look at my loved ones, man. Yep. And I, I look at them, if they feel I'm successful around them and I give them confidence, uh, then that feels like success to me already. Gotcha, gotcha. You know, yeah, yeah. Uh, you're you're only as good as your circle and your loved ones. For sure, man. no, I I couldn't agree with you more. Yeah. And if you can't give if you can't give confidence and love to the would you, the, th the work that you put in to the pe people around you, yeah. then you're doing something wrong. You know, if you can't uplift literally the people around you, yeah. then I feel like you're really doing something wrong. Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. If we were to exclude this past year, which clearly was a very very trying year for you. Again, referencing that the interview you had with Big Hass, you lost a best friend uh, with the blast. And I understand your dad had hip surgery and then you got signed to Warner. Yeah. If we were to exclude that, were there plans to kind of take what you're doing on the road relative to where we are now? You know, obviously with, with transportation not being as readily available, people not moving around as much. But is there a plan, you know, with, with that in mind and then beyond that? Man, <laughs> there was so much plans like that. I just went to went down the drain. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so my manager was in France. Okay. I had to let go of her because of like how the world was shaping up. Yeah. So now she's just my booking agent. Gotcha. And when things open up, definitely trying to we're already trying to secure some bookings from now until summer. Okay. So and that front. Yeah, there was so many plans. I was like go, supposed to go on tour. Gotcha. And I do, I, I created this platform over here called uh, Arab Scum Week. Mm -hmm. So it was like this week long festival, Beirut Arab Scum, uh, Beirut Scum Week. Yep. Uh, Scum starts for, stands for street culture and urban music. Yep. So Beirut Street Culture Urban Music Week. And uh, it was very successful. We did that in 2019 yep. and we were supposed to do it in 2020, but it just didn't pan out. Sure, sure. Um, definitely wanting to do something and export that something i've been thinking about was calling arab scum invasion yeah you know get my all these cool rappers you know from the middle east that i think are amazing and go into multiple cities in, in europe and showcasing what they do i think that would be great um, yeah. that will be that will kind of like help out with the balance of cultural exchange that I feel we have a deficit. In. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and with that, at the same time, trying to get arena to, to Berlin, to the expat community, yep. the Arab expat community, yep. because right now I see so many Palestinians, uh, Syrians, Egyptians and whatnot all over Europe. Yep. And, and they're, because of their status, they can't just come back and enjoy uh, Arab culture or Arab street culture because that's not that's not where they're at. Yeah. So the idea would be like, you know, connecting, bridging those two 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 worlds, yeah. and it's already bridging from the listenership 
But if we can actually create those events, yeah. then we can benefit also as an organizing standpoint. The people from here can benefit from that. Yeah. You know, not yeah. just, you know, European bookers grabbing uh, young young rappers that are already in Europe, book it, make their make their shows, make money off of them. It, let's let's also culturally uh, benefit. From that export yeah yeah, you know? yeah gotcha i i think that would be great and i hope you get to do that sooner than later because like you said i mean having grown up in france and then in, in the states being a nomad is not easy man we're shifting from just like you're from one place and you live and die there you know what i mean like that's just that that's not the case anymore there's so many people that are either have been displaced or moved for you know seeking better options for their kids or, or their families so they're heavily under service. And I feel like, you know, to echo what you, you mentioned, I feel like that would be a great service to both local artists and to people who want to feel connected back home or wherever they're from. You know, I think that would be a great thing to do, you know, and, and I really do hope you get to do that sooner than later. Yeah, man, this, this look, um, I've been surrounded with really like the way we grew up in hip hop. I've been here 10, 11 years. My surroundings were like very conscious individuals. Yeah. The people who succeeded from 10 years ago and then are still doing it right now, they're very conscious individuals. Yeah. So they're not phased about their failures, you know, when it comes to the market yeah. and or their failures when it comes to the industry. Yeah. They're, they're always fascinated by their cultural uh, advancement. Yeah. And I think I just took that from them. And it's all, and, and it's a long, it's the long game. It's definitely for me, it's always been the long game. Uh, even from years ago, I, I noticed after dropping my first album, I'm like, it doesn't matter what I'm putting out and how good I put out these visuals, the sounds or whatever. It, that doesn't make, that doesn't matter until there is an actual scene. Right that there is you built a listenership that understands to how to actually you know embody the culture how to understand yeah. the music how you know like we just need we we were teaching people how to to absorb the culture right. mm -hmm. and we got to a point i think three four years ago where i remember like listening to synaptic because i used to manage him yeah so i remember listening to him and i was i remember listening to him and i was like yo these kids that listen to synaptic listen to synaptic and they don't even know what was what came before them they don't even know rap yeah. they just know this brand of hip-hop and and i'm like that's awesome yeah that's awesome we got to this point that that we there's an understanding of hip-hop that's separate from from like where or, or originates from yeah. because that it makes the listenership much wider of course, yeah. but at the same time we might lose a little bit of the essence of why we gravitated towards hip hop in the first place. Yeah. Now it's just like this, it's like grabbing a guitar. Yeah, yeah. We got it from a certain culture and we can play it and it can go in anything. Uh, I don't want it to be a guitar, you know, yeah. at, at some point. Yeah. I want it to be a hip, the hip hop culture, yeah, of not course. just a guitar. Of course, of course. Do you think there's room in 2021 or in the next few years for a super group a la Wu-Tang Clan? In this part of the world, oh man, I, I really hope so. There was like this hopes when we were younger. Uh, I remember a, a, a group called Katibi Khamse yeah. from the camps over here, yeah. and they were so raw, like they were just like talking about, you know, Jemayet and you know, just like really rugged yeah. sound. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember, and I, I remember being hopeful for them. Um, I don't know, really, you know, that we're such, we're in a culture that's so about the eye, yeah. you know, yeah, like yeah. selfies, uh, TikTok is just really you and your camera sure. and doing stuff, sure, man. Sure. And the capability might not makes, makes people more exclusive. Like I don't need to work with this, a lot of people. Right. I could just be with myself and knock it all out myself. I think that, that does not allow for that. I, I think the contrast though, I mean, if you could find, I don't know, it, a handful, maybe a dozen of like people who are past the me, me, me or the ego phase. I mean, again, a, a certain amount of ego is obviously necessary to get you the next, you, you know, from where you are to where you want to be. But I feel like it would be doing a huge yeah. service to the community and to the artists 
if they could unite somehow. I mean, this is not pie in the sky. I think it's very doable. I mean, obviously, geographically before, I mean, there used to be a time if you weren't in L.A., New York or, or wherever, you, you couldn't make it. But we're, we're in a world now where your Internet connection is about all you need to, to get something done. I mean, obviously, the visuals are, are a lot more important than they, than they once used to be. But I feel like there, there might be magic in, in, if you find the right few to, to, you know, to do something like that. And it doesn't have to be a whole album. It could be an EP. It could be a single. But I just feel like it would really give a huge boost to the community as a whole. Uh, you know, that's a, a, a personal wish of mine, you know, to see that hopefully in the next, you, you know, few years. I'm a huge Wu-Tang fan. So, like, I would love something like that to happen. And me and the guys with the Feril Ultras, yeah. we're all huge Wu-Tang fans. That's why we have, like, this community vibe about us. Yeah. Um, I hope that could happen. And I'd really like to try a- aim for something like that. Um, I've never really thought about it. Again, uh, I got caught up in this whole thing as well where, uh, especially about making music, yeah, yeah. you know, it's like I get caught in the box and I'm like, okay, I'm just going to produce my thing. Uh, yeah, I'm capable of doing that. I, I work on my own, yeah. but I definitely would love to see a group of people rock out and bang. And I honestly, not even just in the, <laughs> not even just in the Arab world. I kind of just want to see it in totality happening now. Wolfgang with Tyler, the creator, yep. he had this crew and it's just hard to keep them together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's definitely something I would, I would want. And, and like, like you said, man, hip hop hooray, like if we're going way back into the conversation, hip hop hooray for me, that community vibe is what got me going, yeah, man. Yeah. You know, that, that, that's what attracted me to hip hop in the first place. Yeah. So to have a group of like seven or like six rappers just kill it all the time. Yeah, I hope so, man. Uh, and the reason I mentioned it to you is because that feels like it's in your veins. You're definitely business minded, not to say that others aren't, but the fact that you, you know, were managing Synaptic and you're not looking at it just as an MC. You're also, you're someone who brings people together. Big has same thing. You know, he's someone, he's a gatherer. He's someone who's looking up both for himself and for others. You know, it, it takes that, you know. Yeah. I think you're a leader. Some people like to be led. Some people are, are, are natural leaders. And, and I feel like someone like you or others that have that kind of common spirit, I feel like you guys can come together and do something really, really powerful. I agree, man. Um, we, we, we go up on this with steps. You yeah, know? for sure. For sure. Um, and the more the more clout you have from creating those steps that you, you've done, the more you, you have pulled to actually make these things happen. Uh, when it came to Arena, it was just finding an opportunity and then trying to tweak that opportunity into a whole organization. Yeah. And this, it was the same with scum week. And every time we did th- these platforms and uh, just shoot for the stars, because we, we never got the budget we needed ever, yeah. ever. Yeah, yeah. You know, it was always like working, working with a spare tire <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> every time, you know, driving with a spare tire every single time. Yeah. And we, we make it happen and we get the buzz that we want. So uh, if that's the next step, I will always I will always think about hip hop as a community thing. Yeah. And I can't not but do that because I'm so grateful to hip hop for giving me this life. Sure. Yeah, uh, I, I can imagine. For giving me this perspective, perspective of the world. So uh, if, that's in the, it's in the, if that's in the books, then hopefully I can be part of it, man. I can imagine. I, I had a question. Listen, one of my favorite tracks from your album is 81 Till Infinity. Is that in any way, shape, or yeah. form connected to ninety three till infinity? Souls of mischief. Uh, I mean, just the just the title. I mean, I'm just, I just, I just like that song. It doesn't sound anything like it, but I was just wondering if that's an you know a nod to that. No, I think it's like thing is with uh, Double A, the preacher man, yeah. uh, San Sharif Dean, rest in peace. Rest in peace. Yeah, he was he he started the hip hop essentials one on one. Um, with DJ Sultasura over here in Radio Beirut, yep. you know, also rest in peace, Radio Beirut. But um, he, so it was like a weekly open mic, gotcha. and a lot of MCs run through that place, and a lot of you know talent was birthed yep. at that place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so that cipher vibe is very ninety three till in infinity yeah. as a song. Yeah. Um, the Souls of Mischief always had that cipher vibe. Yeah. So I felt like he embodied really what gotcha. Souls of Mischief really embodied, gotcha. you know. So what, when I was coming up with the title, there was, you know, multiple ideas for titles, especially with me and the producer. Yeah. But uh, I, it just came to me and I was like, 
yeah, man, he he would probably love that title. Yeah, and that 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 was the bottom line. Gotcha, that gotcha. when I, when I felt like he would have loved that title, uh, that's what that's what I I chose. Do you usually start with the lyrics in mind, or do you start with a beat? Do you start with a title, or d d does it run the gamut? Is it is it different track to track? It's it's super different from track to track. You know, um, Kefuni. I had that's the only track I produced, yep. so I had the instrumental in the bag for like three, four years, yep. trying to pass it to people, but nobody took it, yep. so it just stayed in the vault. And uh, I heard it one time, and then I had a melody in my head, so I was just reciting the melody for like months yep. until I got into the studio with Samet, and he laid this verse, and I was like, okay, let's use this chorus, yep. and then I built on that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Abed, it just really the whole concept started because. MB was at my house. He came from Romania uh, in late 2019. And he took this like synth chord thing that was really a sample of a choir that saying Amen, you know, Amen, yep. Amen, Amen. So I just told him like, pitch that motherfucker down. Let's see how that yeah, sounds. Yeah, yeah. And then once he pressed it and said Abed, it sounded like Abed. <laughs> yeah, I was yeah. like, yo, that sounds like Abed. Yeah. And I'm like, that is, sounds so cool. Yeah. That sounds so dark and weird and cool. Let's just... And then the concept came up to me because it sounded like Abed. And then boom, we have that whole song. It, it fits the Mamluk vibe Yeah, as well. exactly. So it just triggers something. Uh, last night, I had the chorus in my head for like, you know, the baby wants to tell me what your life like. Yeah. I had that for months. Yeah. And then when M MB came through, I was like, we we scratched about four beats, you know, that he had made in that span of three, four hours. Yeah. He would like come with a skeleton and I would try out that hook. And I'm like, nope, nope, nope. Until he came up with this one thing and we're like, yes. That's the one. You know? Yeah. So and but me, I'm like like I like writing a lot. Yeah. So I could a lot of times I would just write bars and bars and bars and just go have a free flow, yeah. write 32 bars, easy, no problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then from those 32 bars, I could dismantle them and rearrange. I'm like a notorious editor. Yeah. So I would just like edit and edit and trash and scrap and rewrite. Gotcha. That's, that's, that's something I, I, I really do, but always have a stack. And I, I, someone asked me recently on my Instagram, just asking advice. And I always told them like, get your notepad, and write and write and write yeah. because you never know because he was worried about having writer's block he's like is that a real thing i'm like it is it is definitely a real thing but it, your brain is like a muscle especially when it comes to writing yeah. the more you use it yeah. the more you know fluid your ideas start coming through Absolutely, so just yeah. keep on writing yeah. and you if, if it hits you when you're in a specific moment that you have to be talented and creative you got to capture you that. want to have a reservoir of ideas Absolutely, yeah that you don't you don't you, you don't come across as a dimwit man you know when you're in a studio and you give given that opportunity yeah. you don't want to start freestyling when you're giving your like 15 minutes of fame uh, absolutely you know I, i'm a big proponent of listen I, I feel like what separates amateurs from pros pros do it on demand and you know and you know there's this whole showing up is half the battle in my mind showing up is the battle you show up it's you know if you if if you yeah. put in your hours you've put in the work you know, the goods will come out. It, 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 I'm glad you touched on the whole uh, writer's block. When you, if, or when you get to that point, are there things that kind of get you out of that? Um, man, like my process of writing is, is I, I consume information. Yeah. Like, uh, so at times it's just research, pure research. Yeah. I go online yeah. and try to consume data and information about a certain topic yeah. and see and just go into a rabbit hole of like keywords that I would uh, that I would find attractive in in my research. Yep. And sometimes it's just like no matter what I research, it, I need that cultural exchange. Yeah. I need to see other people. I need to have a conversation. Yep. Uh, and I remember, uh, and I see that from the greats. You know, yep. I, I see that from Kanye West going to Timberland. And saying, "Way I don't know about this kick. This kick doesn't sound right." Yeah. And there's a video of it on YouTube oh, yeah. where he goes to Timberland, flies to Florida because he thought his song stronger. The mix wasn't right, and the kick wasn't feeling good. Yeah. You know, he's notorious, man. He'll spend days on a kick. He is like, 
the mastermind of tweaking. You know what I mean? So the fact that he went to Timbaland, yeah. it's the right person to go to, you know? Exactly, man. So, he, he, and, and that's me too, man. Like sometimes I would go to my boy at Ross, you know, man's in the state, yeah. amazing rapper and also my neighbor, you know? So if I'm like feeling in a funk sometimes and I just want to pick someone's brain, you know, about certain things, I might talk to him. I have, I've had artists, you know, from different, you know, uh, schools of art, like painters and, just come talk to me just to say, yo, I'm trying to do this. What do you think? Yeah. And then we'll have this dialogue and then something might come up from then. So inspiration, you just need to be hungry for it. Gotcha. gotcha. You no. Know? Yeah. Uh, and uh, open to the conversation yeah. and being culturally open-minded, man, it'll, it'll definitely, definitely further your art. Yeah, for sure. That's, uh, I remember my first time in Europe, uh, that was just like, Oh my God. You know, I, when I went there like in 2009 or 2010, uh, I remember just having this inspiration of like, like, who am I? Yeah. And <laughs> why, why do I like what I like? Yeah. And, and what, what is life? You know, like yeah, yeah. what the things that were going on there, but at the same time, you know, this is something you might want, right. but it still seems so strange happening in front, happening in front of you yeah. that is, you just get so curious of of how it translates back home yeah you know and and if if if, if this is a natural a, a lot of times i start thinking it's like would this is is this a natural progression of how people like experience life yeah. that they get to go through these borders and it's not but you know like that questioning that that uh, that innocent um uh, curiosity it should always be there if you want to find inspiration. Yeah, for sure. I mean, you know, I always do better when I travel. I mean, this is the longest I've gone without leaving the same city. I mean, obviously oh, because of COVID. And it, it, oh. it's it's playing numbers on oh. me, man. So I can only imagine what you're going through, especially if you're used to the touring and, you know, going places that must really be weighing on you. Yeah. And it's one of them, I, just, I think it's one of the things that I can't shake off this Mamluk vibe with me, man. Yeah. I just literally wrote a 24 bar verse a bit ago. And I'm like, this could be on a deluxe version of the album yeah, because yeah. I'm still in the same vibe. I can't get out of it until I kind of, I really want to go see my family. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. uh, one of the inspiration of the album is me being distant from my family and trying to send them money. And, you know, the, this cultural difference yeah. and that me explaining to them how it is over here and the hardships maybe like, that's a big part of it. So I feel like if I go to the Philippines now, it's like a good reset button yeah. to say, you know, you're done, bro. Yeah. You're done with this project. Yeah, yeah. You know, your family's good. You're good. Yeah. Give them a hug. It's all good, man. You know, when you show up at a keyboard or you, you're making a beat, you're, you know, writing a rhyme or whatever, how much of it do you feel like it's an idea that's out there and you're just a vehicle through which it came out? You know, my dad said something about that, you know, um, uh, Cause I was telling him like about my process. Yep. It's only very, very recent that my father accepted me as being a rapper yeah. for a while. I hit it, you know, when yep. I was with Fari for a while. Yep. Uh, and, and or only recently he accepted it because I'm helping with the finances. Sure. So it's like, good job. <laughs> <You> know, like, <laughs> it makes sense now yep. to them as a family. Yep. But uh, he, rem I remember after the fact that he accepted what I did, I, I told him, yeah, dad, I can't talk to you right now. I need to, I need some time. I'm trying to get into the groove. And it's me. And he's like, how do you get into the groove? And it was, uh, firstly, I was like, he's asking, that's really cool. So he asked me and I'm like, like, I don't really know. I just have to be in that state of mind yeah. where I am. It's like opening up your antennas. Oh, he's pretty much, absolutely. you know, yeah, like yeah, yeah. it's like a satellite dish and you're like, I'm waiting for the connection. And then it, it literally, and he said something is like, like OPP, that was a weird song for me. Like, so OPP was like the single, firstly, it's a weird first single to choose from an album, yep. it, but it was chosen by my di director, director Pedro Stemazian, because he's also like, you know, he gets into that dark, weird vibe yep. and he heard like Suicide Bomber is like, hmm, that's very interesting. Yep. I remember saying, I'm like, you really think this could be like a fucking single? It's like, you should do that song. Yeah. And uh, <clears throat> I remember making that song. I, I don't know how I would link OPP to a suicide bomber by calling it other people's property. Yeah. You know, <laughs> right. like, I don't know how that actually happened. Yeah. No idea. But th that whole song 
and the verses and the instrumental. I was in Barcelona, woke up in the morning, you know, weed over there is decriminalized, yeah. you know, smoke a really night. Nice, that's back then. Smoke, uh, smoke a joint. Let's start. Bop, bop, bop. And then hour and a half, bro. Yeah. I was, I was done with everything on that song. Yeah. I don't know how that was one of the first things. And that was literally the song that catapulted me like into having a solo career, gotcha, you know, yeah. because after I gauged, you know, their love for that song in the video, yeah. I was like, Oh, actually, you know, I got validation because multiple, uh, publications wrote about it. Even rollers, Rolling Stones, M E back then yeah. had put that in their top five songs of that month with like Eminem and like Leonard Cohen. I was like, yeah. just my name yeah. being yeah, yeah. even like in the same fucking sentence as these people yeah. really put, put me, but, but, the, but what I'm saying is like, I don't know how that song came out. Yeah. I don't know how I had in a conversation with my friend at college at that point, who was still an assistant director who became a director yeah. now, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, since working, you know, with me in, in multiple videos. So like, in that sense, I'm like, I don't know what happened there. I don't know how it got chosen. Right. And I don't know how it actually people liked it. Yeah. yeah you know, yeah. like it was one of those things. It's a mystery. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Abid was like, I told you it was quick like that. Yeah. Like, it's not like I had that concept and or I had a bar in there yeah. or like, you know, a little chorus. It was, it was, bam, he hit his hand on a chord on a, on a, on an orchestral or like choir sound. And we built on that and I started writing and it was there. Gotcha. That was very quick as well. Uh, Antihero. Yep. Antihero. It was with me and Synaptic. Mm -hmm. We were on tour in Iceland. Yep. We, uh, uh, we were in Airbnb. We, the acoustics was awesome because isolation, yep. the installation, the installation and the houses in Iceland were all wood and amazing. Yep. So the sound, the sound was pretty cool in those rooms. So we're like, let's try to record something because he had brought his laptop in a sound car. Yep. And I had like a neck brace because I had a disc on my neck at that point. Yeah. Uh, I, I just had an injury. Yep. So he was like, hey, how about, you know, like, you know, like, let's call it, you know, let, he, he started rapping. I can't carry any, everybody because I used to joke around like, what's wrong with your neck? You've been carrying the scene for too long. You know, like that was the joke I was saying. Yeah. <laughs> and then, and then he actually like, I don't know if he connected those dots or subconsciously or not even at all, yep. but he put that in his chorus. And then I was like, okay, bang, 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 bang. And we knocked that song out in an hour and a half as well. That's awesome. Another favorite is the prayer hand emoji. I love the title. Yes. It's my favorite emoji period. Like, you know, I'm that's the one I always sent, you know, I'm not, Me too, but, man. but, but like there was something about that song that really grabbed me, man. It, it's got the most crossover appeal. Like, I feel like it's, it, you know, it, it's the most radio friendly for some reason, but, but it really touched me, man. Yeah. I, you, can you tell me a little about the process of writing that song and, and kind of what it means to you? Um, I was already, I, I wasn't finished with the album. Mm -hmm. Um, but when I was, I started when Zoo started writing, making that instrumental or producing that instrumental. Yeah. I remember hearing it, and after the first few bars, I remember saying, "This is the outro for the album." Yeah. And and through that uh, through that lens and of understanding that this is going to be an, an the outro, I remember thinking, "Wow, this." album is starting to look very braggadocious you know a lot of passion yeah. and some anger yeah. you know so i wanted to end it by being at peace with my decisions yeah. you know being at peace with uh the hustle and the hard work being at peace with not reaching where you need to be not, you know like just being patient yeah. and understanding and that's where the prayer hand emoji came from yeah. it's like oh, yeah. it's all good if you don't like what i do it's all good if you like what i do it's all good if you hate me because i'm successful or you hate me because i'm or i'm not i don't look like you as long uh, as long as me and my family and the people around me are good then that's cool that, that, and that's yeah. that's what the confidence i want to give a lot of migra migrant communities and it's like if if your environment is hostile to you, stay focused on your loved ones, whether they're right next to you or they're back home. Yeah. You need to hone in into that and let that inspire you to dominate your environment. It felt like a journey listening to the album, and and I loved all the all the features that you you know all the the MCs and the rappers that you you had on. I think it's a beautiful album. Thank you, man. 
you know, th- 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 there are some real good gems in there. And, and, and I hope, I hope it does really well for you. I'm glad that you're with Warner. Thank Hopefully you. they're, they're doing their part in, in, in trying to push, you know, your message. You mentioned on Big Hass's interview also about possibly looking to go to the next place. It's, it's clear that Lebanon, unfortunately, is going through a really dark time right now. And, it, and it's really tough for a lot of people. So it would make sense for people to, to, to look elsewhere for, you know, you got to live, you, you want to, yeah. you want to grow and stuff. So I, I know you mentioned that you, you might go somewhere else. Have you a figured out where that might be? And are, are you worried at all that, that it might affect the kind of music that you make? Uh, yeah, I definitely feel like it's going to affect my music for sure. Yeah. That's, that's without a doubt. If I'm, if I'm a person who's really influenced by my environment yeah. and my personal, um, you know, my personal journey, yeah. my personal journey dictates what I write about. Sure. So me moving will definitely affect that. But looking to somewhere else, it's just starting to feel like, especially after Mamluk, you know, yeah. like Mamluk kind of was a little prophetic about like how I'm being perceived. Like even before Mamluk was getting, you know, spoken about, I had this vibe and this chip on my shoulder that, you know, that maybe the scene itself here, because of the lack of resources recently, yeah. I have a target on me, yeah. you know, yeah, yeah. and it's seeming more apparent as I, as I got signed and things like that. Yeah. And so while I was writing it, I just had a hunch that it was like that. But when this album started rolling out, it started getting clearer and then it started getting clear. Yes, my environment is hostile. Yeah. Yes, the comments on my YouTube from local people or fans have been getting a lot worse. Yes, there's a narrative out there, you know? Yeah. So now I'm like, think, I'm just thinking, I actually don't need to be here. I also don't need to be here to do successful things to be here because my contacts are always going to be here and what I've done has always been here, yeah. you know? Yeah, yeah, like yeah. it's always going to remain. Yeah. So... It's not about me leaving because I don't want to do stuff for Beirut. But I just want to feel comfortable now, I understand. you know, yeah. me personally. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and Beirut is, 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 it's not just hostile to me. It's hostile to everybody around, right? Like you said, but specifically for foreigners in the past year, yeah. there has been horrendous things that's been going on with them. You know, yeah. Ethiopians being just sitting outside their embassy, yeah. You know, just horrendous stuff. It, it's bad to itself right now. Yeah, exactly. It, it's so sad. So yeah. when I remember like recently, sorry, I remember like recently there was like a camp near Tripoli in, in near Tripoli that got burned down, a Syrian uh, refugee camp. Yeah. And uh, and on the same day, um, uh, somebody I know called Ingrid Baweb, there was a video of her that she was hitting a dog, yeah. you know, Oof. and that went viral. Because, you know, her dog ran away. She grabbed the dog. She was worried. I don't know what's the, you know, like what her mind frame was. Um, obviously, do not hit your dog. She says she was so worried that she hit him. Anyways, that video went viral. Yeah. And now she's pretty much X'd out of the internet, oof, you know, oof. because of the focus on that. Yeah. But when 300 people lose their homes, when 300 people lose their homes yeah. because of a, a refugee camp getting burned, with nobody... Uh, tweeted about yeah, that yeah, yeah. nobody you know did anything about that and i remember specifically at that time i was thinking like wow it's gonna get a lot worse yeah. and uh and i'm not gonna be you know from i'm not gonna be in the group that's gonna they're gonna look good on you yeah, know and be like yeah, yeah. yeah this guy he did you know like i'm gonna be the one with the target on my back sort yeah, of yeah, yeah i feel you i want to shift gears a little bit and just ask you about your influences coming up and to this day who are you influenced by whether it be rappers or producers yeah uh, rappers uh jay-z is a huge influence to me yeah. uh i feel like his longevity uh his his artistic and business decisions are so intermingled within each other yeah. like he has like a i feel like i understand his philosophy on it yep and uh I, I and i adhere to it so I, I i love what he does in that sense and because the guy reinvent himself yeah. so much so you know like 
I always flip between albums. You know, like if I'm listening to Reasonable Doubt, I'll tell you Reasonable Doubt yeah. is the dopest Jay Z album. Yeah. If I hear Blueprint, you know, one, yeah. I'll be like, Blueprint one is the hottest because especially that was when I was really getting into hip hop. Yeah. Like yeah, yeah. when I was 16, 17, and when it came out, that was like, oh my God, you know, with the Nas beef. Yeah. Yeah. So the Blueprint one era is big on my list. Yeah. But also when I moved to Lebanon, the Black album, you know, where he, he was set to retire. Yeah. And, you know, created that uh, era of like, you know, like right now, Logic just retired and he came back and he's going to release a project. Yeah. Like now it's, a <laughs> yeah. class, it's normal for rappers <laughs> right. to retire right, and come right. back because of Jay-Z, yeah. you know, so he, he, he always reinvented himself. And um, I feel like I took, a, I took a page off his book when it comes to that. Sure. In terms of like having artistic balls to just like say what you want and also sonically do what you want which I really took from Kanye West yeah. and my first album, Making Music to Feel at Home, because sonically, that was just like, what the fuck am I doing? You know, yeah. uh, it was really me trying out different things, sampling really, really strange things. And uh, I, I, so that was my in terms of production, yeah. in terms yeah, yeah. of artistic output and in terms of ballsiness. Yeah. I really like Kanye and I respect him for that. Sure. And in terms of the pen, like just lyric, straight yep, lyricism. Yep, yep. I feel like my Lupe Fiasco Oof. and Black Thought from the Roots okay. are like a, a big inspiration for me. And that's big. I, I wouldn't have thought that, but I, I can kind of see it now that you say that. I mean, everyone you just <laughs> mentioned is awesome. For some reason, you know, as I was listening to um, your album, I was kind of hoping and thought I would find a track that would be similar to, do you remember... Um, Kid Cudi's um, Day and Night. Yeah. I, I just felt like if you had done something that was a little more pop leaning, it would have been in that vein. Um, I don't I don't know where that came from. I just thought yeah. I, I just thought I'd share that with you as I was listening to it. <laughs> Someone posted on like on my, one of the videos uh, for uh, a song called I'm Bored. Yeah. And he was like, oh, this is really a lot of Cudi vibes on I'm Bored. And then I had also some people before said that about the song of uh, last night, yep. you know, which where I actually use auto tune yep. on last yeah, night, yeah, yeah. which is very rare for yep. me. Yep. So, uh, and I think it's that mm, having a deep voice yep. and trying to hit melodies with a deep voice yep. would, would make me lean into that. Uh, but I had like, when I was producing, I, I definitely had like conscious, like conscious decisions of making something that's more like palatable for a mainstream yep. Uh, crowd and that that song would be fresh money on on actually on tiktok yeah uh they, they put it on tiktok and it's already been used like four thousand five hundred times yeah, or awesome. something like that that's you awesome, know man. so on four thousand five hundred different videos yeah, yeah yeah so that definitely has a sonic has a sonical like a gravitas sure, to it sure, you sure. know like it's it's very easy to listen to. Yeah. It's easy to put on other things, yeah. even though lyrically or like conceptually, it's it's quite a complex topic. Yeah, for sure. But but I think I think that's where I actually not in a sonical manner. I think I need to actually the concept if I want to reach more people is like just simplify it a little bit more. Yeah, yeah. That's that's I think would be. But I'm like Jay Z though. I don't like to dumb it down. Uh, I'm the same way as Lupe. Yeah. Uh, I'm not the type to really dumb it down. And, and the same way with Jay-Z at some point he was doing his, you know, his thing and nobody wanted to hire, you know, nobody wanted to sign him. Nobody, yeah, you know, yeah. he just did his thing, made his own label and worked. So I feel like I'm going to be in the same manner. It's just like sooner or later, if so, hopefully people will just understand the world I'm trying to bring yeah, there yeah, yeah. to them. You just and I feel like if, if they just give it that moment and say, Hey, that's, that's a different world. And you, and you, you get, you sink into it. Then I, I feel, I feel like they'll understand everything, yeah, yeah, yeah. but you just have to give it a moment. And I, I know that's, this is not the era we live in. We're not in the era of like running to a whole album. We, they want the bangers as soon as possible, yeah. but I think I think with the with Warner, I have the best chance to put something out like that out like that yeah. that has that gets attention. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And 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 shout out to Warner, you know, because they were they were not they 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 didn't limit me on what I wanted to say. That's Obviously, great, they would notify me about markets, yeah. you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, 
and they would they would want me to extrapolate on things like i i think with veni vidi vici i say something like allahumma salli ala cash flow yeah. get the profit that's how you follow sunnah yeah. you know and you know i I'm, their eyes are like what i'm like hey i'm not talking about me i'm not saying <laughs> i don't follow sunnah no I'm actually Hajji. I went to Hajj already, yeah, you know, yeah, like yeah. I did Amr a couple of times, yeah, you know, yeah, so yeah, yeah. I, I'm about that. <laughs> I do think it's a good pairing and I and I love that they're putting their weight behind it. You've definitely paid your dues and I, I hope it is as successful as you hope it was when you were done with it and, and declared it finished because that's that's a very important thing. I can't thank you enough for the time, Chino. This this has been great and, and you know, I, I hope to have you on again, hopefully in person when you're in Dubai or if I'm ever in Beirut or wherever we, we may cr cross paths. Uh, for those that want to support you or follow what you're doing, what, what's your, um, I'll, I'll put your internet, your your handle, whether it's Twitter or Instagram or whatever. Is it just Chino with a Y everywhere or do you have uh, any? Everywhere. Oh, everywhere. Okay. I'll put that up. And again, thanks a million. Is there any closing? Do you have any closing thoughts or do you, do you, do you just want to instill anything upon anyone that's, that's, that's kind of listening and that, that's a fan or, or just now finding out about it? Um, just listen to the music. I think, I think if you listen to all the projects and listen to this interview, this interview has been pretty uh, vast. You know, there's, you, you've spoken a lot about a lot of things and, chronologically i feel like after you hit, listen to this interview and listen to my albums i feel like a lot of things will like the dots will get connected and uh so let's just keep it with the music man and the art itself awesome man best of luck to you man you don't need luck you're doing exactly what you need to be doing it's all about the grind i i, I, I commend you man big up and, and congrats again on the album man i hope it does really well for you thank you man all right chino we'll keep doing your thing as well Thanks, man brother. we'll talk real soon for sure right, man cheers